phone, and sure enough, he talked to God for about 15 minutes. And so anyway, he gets off the phone. The next week, he goes to another church. And he goes in, and he says, do you have, a, do you have one of those long-distance phones calls to God? I really enjoyed that. He said, yes. So he went over, and he, he went over, and he talked to God. So he come here to Open Bible, and Pastor Phil was here. And he says, you got one of those telephone? I want to talk to God. Do you have any long distance? Do you have any telephone to, I can talk to him? Got a red phone? He says, no, we don't. He says, you don't? He says, you mean I can't talk to God on the phone here? He says, nope. He says, why? He said, because he's local. He's here. Amen? And that's what we do here. We don't have an empty cross. That's empty cross for a reason. It's because Jesus is no longer on the cross. He's, he's here. He's with oh, God's Spirit is here. Sometimes we come in and we treat God like he's so far off. We treat him. You know something? People look to the universe to find God. They look all over the universe. We're putting rocket ships up there. I want to tell you something. You're not going to find God in the universe. You know why? Because he made the universe. Folks, before I open my prayer today, I want us to realize one thing. That we don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a living Savior. He's alive. He's here. He communicates with us. And he's still and he's still alive. He's not somebody we pray off to some written prayer. It's a, we talk to him from the heart. You know, today's Mother's Day. And if you walked up to your mother and you're one of your kids did, and I enjoyed that song by the Ellsbury young people. That was really good. Brothers and sisters up here, that was good. But if I walked up to my mother and I said, Dearest mother, how art thou today? It is good to see thou us today. And now is our wonderful mother. What hast thou me for supper? She would look at me and say, get the net. God is alive through Jesus. We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Savior. And he communicates with us today and so many people in the South. There's a lot of good churches out there. They worship God in different ways. But whatever church is really serving God knows he's alive. And I want to open up with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray today that you'll bless each and every one of these graduates, Lord. Bless all the youth leaders, Lord, that work so hard, Lord, with these young people. Bless the other leaders in the church, Lord, and the people that come in and help, God. Thank you, Jesus, for the greeters this morning, Lord, that took my place, Lord, for the man that be Roger for him taking it over and done a great job. I just pray, dear Jesus, for the people that were up here, Lord, the musicians. Every one of them are doing it because they love you, Lord. And that's what it comes from, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm very happy to have my cousin Joe and Judy Russell with us this morning for the first time. And just hope you enjoy yourself and make them feel welcome. I tell everybody new that comes in, everybody new that comes in, we have several new people, by the way. If you don't get your hand shook ten times, you come and talk to me. I'll shake it the other nine. And I watched one person going out the door not too long ago, get your hand shook ten times, and they said, multiply that. <laughs> and that's the way it should be, isn't it? We're in God's house. People should feel like they're wanted. People should feel like we, they, we, we care about them. I'm going to read to you a story about the Good Samaritan. I had a sermon this morning. I had it all lined up. I like organization. And God told me, just speak from your heart today. I even got up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I used to go over my sermons, and I, I preached a 20-minute sermon to the cat. <laughs> and I like organization. I don't like this organization. I don't like sloppy work. But God told me this morning as I was praying. I felt he did. He went back in the prayer room. Some of the ladies prayed with me. I want you to speak from the heart today. And am I nervous? Of course. I, I, every time I get up and I speak before somebody, I'm nervous. Because I never know if that's going to be that person. Somebody's going to be in this congregation. And this is the last time you'll ever be inside this church. You guys know what that you, I think you can understand what we're saying this week, especially about it. It's very serious. R. Bryant Mitchell, the former head of Open Bible Standard Church as many years ago, was sitting next to Billy Graham. And he was sitting next to Billy Graham. I don't know why. I don't know the situation. It was before one of the crusades. Billy Graham's hands were shaking. And he looked at him and said, your hands are shaking? Billy Graham, the, one of the biggest evangelists in the world, he said, yes, my hands are shaking. 
There's thousands of people out there. And God has put the responsibility for me to get up and tell them about Jesus. And maybe some of them, this is going to be the last time they ever hear. God, help me to reach them. I'm very serious about when we take and we, we, we just take and we get up in front. A responsibility is there in the ministry. It says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, who was the enemy of all Jews, and as Samaritans and Jews hated each other, the wounded man was a Jew. It says, so when the Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out some money and gave to the innkeeper. He said, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for my expenses. One of the, one of the people had been asking him, asked him a question. And what she replied, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man? Who was the real man of God? And the reply was the one who showed mercy on him. I got one more little verse. I want a really small verse. And this is something that is very important. And it's in Galatians. No, it's not in Galatians. I was, it means it's in Mark. Excuse me, in Mark. It said people were bringing some little children to Jesus for him to place hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was, in, he was upset. He said to them, Let the little children come unto me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say unto you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took children into his arms, and he placed his hands on them and blessed them. Folks, you know, you never know who you're set next to in this church. I've seen people come in. I go, one of my colleagues is in ministry. I've done hospital ministry, chaplain work. I've walked into rooms, and I've seen people with looks on their faces. I've seen people that were frightened. One of the hardest things to walk in on when you're called into the emergency room is an attempted suicide or a suicide. I had to deal with both. And you know something? The, this, the families are looking just scared. Every one of those family members are saying, is it my fault? What did I do? What did I do? It's the, most, it's the hardest ministry there is because they probably didn't do anything. What about the man that attempted to take his own life? I've got a chance to talk to people. I gathered a man and a wife together. One time, and he was in, this, in the room. The doctor had asked me to come in. And I said to her, how would you feel if he would have, if he would have succeeded? She said, I would have cried my eyes out. I couldn't stand it. The man looked at her, and he started to cry. He started to cry. He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't know I would do this to you. I'm so sorry. And I told them to talk to each other for a few minutes, and they opened up their hearts like they hadn't for a long time because they were both scared to before, but this was me. This was almost happened. And they started to cry together. The man's home today. Him and his family are in good shape. But sometimes we just don't open up our hearts. It just becomes a tradition to us. It becomes such a tradition to us that we just kind of take it for granted. And I, I'll tell you something. There are people out here that are hurting, that are hurting bad. And you know, there's Christians here, and when these people walk in for the first time, and I'm talking about to every way of life, there's many people here that are visitors this morning. And I don't mean I'm centering on you. I don't mean that. What I mean is we have people come in every Sunday. Some of them are visitors because they have family. Others are visitors on other reasons. And then there's some people that come in because they're just plain lonely. You can see it in their faces. And Jesus looked upon these people. You know who he picked as, he, as people to write the Bible? Naturally, he picked some scholars. Then he picked a fisherman, a crooked tax collector that had been saved, a man that doubting, doubting Thomas, and it went on down the line. A lot of people don't know the names of all the disciples. There was another James. There was two Judases. People didn't know that. You go down to their names. And you know something? These were good men, except for one. 
There was 11 good men and one man. Do you know who's known the best? The one man that didn't do anything, but these other men never got recognized. Well, some of them did. But when we do something for God, I, I tremble inside because I worry that there's going to be somebody that's going to be here that's going to really need a touch from the Lord. And I didn't say the right thing. I didn't do the right thing. Or Jesus threw me. Because I'm going to tell you something. God loves you. He loves you so much he sent his son down to die for us. You know, the night before Jesus, the night before Jesus went to the cross, the night before I prayed in the garden, he went over and Jesus didn't have to do this. A lot of times we think Jesus was just a man. He was half God and half man. He was tempted like as we are, only not the same way. When they, Peter picked out the sword, when the soldiers come to get Jesus, he cut off the soldier's ear. Jesus reached down and he said, Peter, I could call legions of angels right now. I'm the son of God. I don't have to die on that cross tomorrow if I don't want to. I'll still be in heaven. But he said he went off to the garden after that and he started to pray. Now on the cross is suffocation. You don't die of the blood of the nails in the hands. You die because you come forward. It goes against your lungs. The horrible of death it is about a six, seven, uh, an eight-hour suffocation. Horrible. Have you had everybody cut off your window? You've ever been out of breath? You're panicking. He said, Father, if there's any other way, tell me, Father. And the Father said, Son, to his son, there's no other way. And Jesus says, then I will do it. I will die on the cross. So he didn't have to. He didn't have to. You know, the devil tempted Jesus. When he tempted him, we say, oh, Jesus could have sinned. Well, yes, he could have. Absolutely. He lived for 33 years as a man. But you know what his sin was? It wasn't telling a lie. It wasn't going out and getting with another woman. It wasn't going out and getting drunk. You know what his sin could have been? And the devil tempted him every time on this. You look at the, you look at the temptations. It went out in the desert. He hadn't eaten for a long time. He said, turn these rocks into bread. Then you can have something to eat. Jesus said, a man cannot live by bread alone. The second one, he took him up on the tower. He said, jump off the tower. Angel will grab me. I won't let you die. He said, no. He took him finally. He took him, he took him and he said to him this. He said, if you be the son of God, you be the son of God. And he tempted him again and again throughout his life. You know what he tempted him to do? You know what the temptation was? Oh, it wasn't tell a lie. It wasn't rob a bank. Use your God power. It's there. You can use it. Use your God power beyond what a man can do. You ever seen a man turn a rock or out in the desert? You get out of your car and along the road, and I'm hungry. Okay, let's turn this boulder into a loaf of bread. You say, well, that's crazy. You know, he said, jump off the temple. You know, I asked him to jump off the temple, and angel will grab you. He wasn't supposed to die that way. Besides that, if he would have jumped off the temple and, and an angel would have caught him, you know what the devil would have said? Huh, he tried to commit suicide before the cross. You ever thought of that? I'm going to destroy his ministry now. He was tempted to use your God power, but he chose not to. All he would have had to say was, Father, send legions of angels. But in his heart, he couldn't do it because he loved us. And that's how much he loved you. He loved me. Is there a hell? Yes. I, I always say this to people when it comes to the subject of hell. I don't preach people going to hell. I believe there is a hell. I preach people, tell them about Jesus, and telling them how to avoid hell, how to accept Jesus. And I let Jesus do the judging about who goes and who doesn't. Because I don't know their whole life. So I'm not the judge when it comes. My job is to lead them to Christ. Lead him to Christ. I've seen miracles. I think say God is dead. God does not exist. One time when I was pastoring in Polo, Illinois, we started a bus ministry. God still works miracles. Believe me, I've seen it. I believe me. There's a little, I, we went to this one house, and this father answered the door. They were Catholic. They were good people. I have nothing against the Catholics. But I mean, we all got ways of worshiping God. I don't judge other churches. But in this case, he said he was a Catholic man. He said, my little girl is dying of meningitis. She's been in a coma now for a long time. He just got tears in his eyes and was, it was 25 miles away, or about 15 miles away. And I had my busing director with me. 
And I normally don't say this. I said, let's get in the car. I want to go down and pray for him. So we went down there, and we went into this big hospital in Dixon, Illinois. There was a great big wooden door as you walked into the children's area. And we walked in, and remember that door closing. And we're not miracle workers. We're just human beings doing what God wants us to do. And the family was in there and said, our priest just left. I said, well, that's fine. I'm glad he got to visit you. In fact, in the hospital, I call it different ministries from churches for people. Well, anyway, so I said, can we just pray out here? We didn't even go into the isolation where the little girl was. We prayed out there, just a short prayer. We left. The door went closed. I remember that big wooden door? About two days later, when well, you got bus ministries, anything can happen. Anything. You don't know what kind of call you're going to get. I get this woman on the phone. This is so-and-so. What is with you? Oh, no, what happened now? I listen. Okay, what happened? She said, what is it? My little girl was in a deep coma. And she said, when that big wooden door shut, she sat up. The doctor says it's a miracle. They say there's no miracles nowadays. I'm going to tell you, folks, there is miracles nowadays. It said in the Bible, seeing a miracle recognizes two different things. And until we recognize the presence of God in our life personally, personally. I've been baptized three times. You have? Yes, now, I'm, not against, I, I'm not against different ways of baptism. But let me explain what happened. First, I was baptized as a baby. That's okay. Some people do that. I'm not knocking that. We do it a little different, but I'm not going to get on that. that then, there, then I took and I went to another church, and they said in order to get to heaven, you need to get baptized. So I took and I never just, okay, I want to get to heaven. So I went in and I got baptized. And then a few years later, I found Jesus Christ as my Savior. Something touched my heart. And I said, I want to get baptized again. You've been baptized? No. I wasn't baptized. I was sprinkled, dunked, and baptized later. Because if it's not in my heart, it's not baptism. I just as well take a bar of soap and got some use out of it. Because that's all the more it meant. And I'm not running down the person that baptized me. They didn't know how I felt. I don't mean it bad about anybody. But you just as well take a bar of soap and a towel and get something good out of it if you don't know Jesus. Baptism does not save anybody. It's an act of obedience that helps us grow in the Lord. I firmly believe in it. But until we know Jesus in our heart, I've had people say, if you live a good life, if you live a good life, you'll go to heaven. The Bible does not say that. Yes, a good life is like a good life is a product of what of what you do after you accept Jesus. None of us are good. None of us deserve to go to heaven for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. I don't deserve to go to heaven. You don't deserve it. Not one person. The only way we can get there is just like it's just like it's, it's just like this. A man was in prison. He was going to go to the electric chair. A lot of people don't know it. I've been told you can actually do this. It's never been done. Another man stepped in. This man deserved to be put to death. Another man stepped in and says, I'll go with the electric chair for him. He deserved to go, but I'll go for him. You can let him go. That's a good example of what Jesus did for us. He said, I'll go and take death. The wages of sin is death. I will die in his place so he can go to heaven. But God's not, a, God's not a dictator. He doesn't force people. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. You can go to the electric chair yourself. But all you have to do is ask him to forgive you and accept it. And so many people find that so hard to believe. It's so simple. It's so simple. And yet they make it so hard. They make all these rules. They make all these, these images you've got to do. Yes, it's good to do them. It's good to be a pastor because you're obeying God. It's good to be an usher. One young man, he went out and he got a special, and this is a, just a movie. I'd say it's true. God told him he was going to use him in a very special way. And he was thinking, I'll tell you next Sunday night. Wow, well, this isn't the truth, but he was all excited about Sunday night. I'll reveal it to you. He got so excited, he was running to church on the way Sunday night. Oh, I'm so excited. And he saw a crippled man. He said, I'd like to help you, but i got to get to church to see what God wants me to do. He's in another lady that needs some help with her groceries. i got to get to church, see what God wants me to do. And it went on down the line. You ever heard the sermon in the, the, thing, the scripture in the Bible that says angel unaware? It's in the David Dale Evans wrote a book on it. 
Sometimes it says in the Bible, you'll help a complete stranger, and it will be an angel unaware. Look it up when you get home. I don't make up the Bible. It'll be an angel unaware. He got to the church. He was all excited, and he went the pastor come down, and God spoke, and he said, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I showed you on the way. You're not going to be a Billy Graham. You're not going to be uh, a great minister, but I'm giving you a life to help other people. A life to help other people. I want you to do that. You had three chances to do it when you come in. They were all three angels. And you were so in a hurry to see what God wanted. You passed up what he really wanted to do. I saw a lady one time. I had this one man. I personally, you ever had somebody you didn't like? I'm glad Mark ain't here. <laughs> That's a good friend of mine. <laughs> anyway, uh, but the thing is, you have somebody you didn't like. And I couldn't stand this guy. He was repulsive. I couldn't stand him. I didn't even like looking at him. And one day there was this little Christian lady. She was standing with him. She was sincere. And this man, he'd done everything against God. And, I, and like I said, I was a Christian. I didn't like him. And she looked over at her. He was standing up in the back of a pickup as he drove by. And she looked at him, and she was got tears in his eyes. I said, what are you crying for? She said, I'm so sad. He's going to hell, and he don't know it. Please, somebody reach him. Sincere, not judge, but sincere. Until we get that feeling into our hearts to care. To care. One of my professors said, a lot of times we as Christians... We want to testify, but we don't want to really listen to what that person's saying. A little boy in our church in Polo, Illinois, six-year-old, his name was Stoney. He was super brat, super brat. I'm surprised he didn't wear a uniform. And he's sitting in the front row, and we had Chester Graves, a real good child evangelist, come in. He said, put that kid in the back row. I took and I stood over him in a chair. And he was sitting there in that chair. And at the end of the service, a little stony turned around and looked up and he said, I want to go to heaven. I said, why don't you come on down, Stony, and we'll pray. A little super brat said that to me. We went down and we went down to the altar and he prayed. I want to tell you, you know what the miracle of that was? Two weeks later, he had his dad by the thumb leading him to the altar. You never know who you're dealing with. You never know. But God... Let's put it in our hearts to care. Let's put it in our hearts to listen. Let's put it in our hearts not to judge. Let's put it in our hearts, God help me, to reach this person. Let's all bow. Before I dismiss in prayer, I've asked somebody to come up and sing a song for us. It's called Through It All. One of my biggest trials in life, when my wife came home from the hospital the first time with a heart attack, Martin Path Falls got up in the Assembly of God Church, and they said, we want to dedicate this song to you, Arlen, our friend, because we know how upset you are. I want you to listen to it real close, the words of it.
every head bowed and every eye closed. Like I said, this isn't the sermon I was going to give, but it's the one God laid deeply on my heart. You know, I've seen people in church one Sunday morning, the next Sunday morning they're gone to heaven. And I'm on my heart, in my heart, and I mean it, I say this with fear and trembling and I'm not putting on. I don't want one person today walking out of here not knowing that Jesus can save you no matter what you've done. One woman told me one time, she said, I regret my mistakes, but I don't regret what I learned from them. God loves you. He loves each and every one of you. You say, I've done too many bad things. I can't get right with God. I can't do it. You know, that's right, you can't. Not without Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and I'm not, I just want you to bow your heads. And Is there anybody here that's going through such a rough time? Or we're not running a gossip section here. That's why I want the eyes closed. And you'll say, God help me. I don't know what I'm going to do. God, I see a hand back there. Anybody else? I see a hand. We're going to pray for you. We're not going to call you up front. We're going to pray for you, though. Is anybody else? Said, I know just a few months ago, my grandson had died of a heart virus. My son had the same thing. They told us in the month of February that there was no more hope. It went for too long. God turned everything around. His heart went back from 25% to 42%. My son's driving a truck again. He passed the state exam. Don't tell me there is no God. I can't guarantee you he'll do that for you, but I just, one man said this. He said, if I got to go through something, I'd rather go through it with him than without him. Amen. We're going to pray. Anybody wants to come forward and speak or pray afterwards, remember, everything you say is in confidence. We're here for that's our reason. We may jump, we may rally, we may clap our hands for God, but it comes right down to it. We care about your soul. We care about you. Nobody's so unimportant that God doesn't love them. Nobody's so important that God can't love them. But right now, I pray for this hand to come up, Lord, today. I pray for other people's hearts, God. And like the song said, through it all, through it all, I put my trust in Jesus. We know, Lord, that the world can take our money away. They can take everything away from us, but they can't take heaven away from us. And I pray this day, as you walk out this door today, that each and every one in here walk out knowing that all I have to do is ask and really mean. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go. You are dismissed.